Hello everyone, today we document a prototypical 8th century BC Phoenician Byrim. I actually inserted pictures from Hellenistic times to dilute a bit the pictures that are not uh, infinite about this topic, at least the ones that I can uh, use uh, copyright free. Uh, and however, there are uh, some interesting points to touch, especially about, in fact, this quite archaic time. Actually, what we know about the Phoenician Byremes of around 700 um, BC derives from some Assyrian reliefs, right, that, uh, of course, document uh, Phoenician ships uh, employed by, by the Assyrian Empire. Uh, at the time we discussed the Syrian warfare at a point we also saw something about um, river crossings and stuff but here we are mostly discussing properly Mediterranean uh, warfare and there are some interesting points to make because you know the um, the Phoenicians of course were the dominant trading nation in the Mediterranean around this point right and they would maintain always a hell of a of a novel tradition, the same Carthage, as you know, is is a is a Levantine offspring, and it would colonize great part of the western, the central Mediterranean. The Phoenician maritime technology that made school uh, in Mediterranean, and that you know, in school books is presented usually before um, the rise of the Hellenes, uh, and thus as some kind of um, prototypical, um, uh, let's say, model for the, the later development of the um, of the trireme, etc. And if you actually look up to generally, um, the invention of the bireme uh, is credited. You mostly read that the Phoenicians were credited with that. So we all know what the the bireme is, right? This this ancient ord ship we're still at this point in a moment in which wasn't much of a of a difference between uh say a trading ship and and, and a warship so it, it was a galley with two superimposed rows of oars on each side up to around this point in or at least as far as we can document because we think that the byreme was around from an older time actually um there was only one row of oars, right? At, at the same level, properly, uh, up to a certain time before there hadn't been, or at least we cannot document what, what is properly a deck. Um, and we rely on, in fact, mostly these Assyrian um, reliefs that are today preserved at the Louvre in, in Paris. Um, depicting like a fairly good this is a Syrian art proper right so the, the, there may be some kind of artistic license as far as these Phoenician ships that are represented as such because they at least in the context of the the picture these were you know um, employed by by other rulers of, of the Levant um, in fact the image of the, the the most distant clear image of a Bayre so we tend to say that um, the, the Phoenicians were the first ones to, to adopt this, um, this, this type of ship. They, they probably implemented in their own, and so we go by that. This is a bit of a technologistic explanation, meaning that this, this thing of attributing to one specific people, like these guys were the first in or, you know, they, they invented it, they came up with that, they created it out of scratch, right? Naturally, things are a bit more complex. Um, there is no doubt that the Phoenicians were uh, the, the people that in order to protect their merchant shipping, develop fast or war galleys. And, and also, in fact, may have been, for example, the first one to fit uh, these with rams and at the prow, right? But uh, the process to which this happened was very gradual, right? And it um, we can document it mostly as a fair, a complete. The moment w which we can, in fact, document it 
uh, from from the sources unequivocally. However, uh, the level of development of Venetian ships were probably quite similar to to, to the one in the rest of the Mediterranean, and and or at least you know closer and still importantly advanced cultures like le- the Greeks were, for example, already at that time, right? So. Uh, it's, uh, there is no doubt that the Phoenicians implemented this technology the greatest, that were the most advanced. So they may have been properly the one. There, there must have been a Byrene appearing for the first time. Uh, and maybe it was them. However, while we can uh, credit them w- with the uh, this most complete Byrene, we do have an early group of pictures essentially dating to the 8th century BC. So we're not surprisingly, exactly at the same time, this the sources to are preserved at the Louvre. Um, essentially, um, showing what uh, at the cross. So this fundamentally this this bireme, as it, the term would be, would arrive from from later sources. But this idea of having properly two rows of oars, one superimposed, the other in a way in a structure which we will see now, that is actually. Hellenic, right? Um, and we may have some hint that this technology was around from a much earlier time. Again, it's, it's quite crude, primitive, and simple, and the source is not even that easy to to interpret per se artistically. Or at least uh, we don't know how you know that uh, from the picture to to real to to the mechanical reality, this can be reconstructed exactly. Uh, they may have been around just among the Greeks as among the Phoenicians, uh, equal since the the second millennium BC even, right? The Homeric tradition may that as you know was essentially um, composed over was stratified over different centuries. It came to be written down just you know in this following um, times um, it may allude to. Right, um, with the namely the idea of two rowers per seat, specifically, and that may have been placed essentially at two di- slightly different levels. Right, the pare say resia would be the house riggers that in different ships may mean different thing, but and then this this aspect is important because uh, there was probably already. Uh, something conceived for creating multiple rows, not just two, but even three, considering that the triremes eventually were to come about and become somehow standards in, in, a, in a few other centuries. But um, the previous ships had fundamentally just maintained a single row of oars uh, on, on each side. Right, The, the most common ship was the Pentaconter, uh, which counted, in fact, 50 oars on an average structure, naturally having multiple rows of oars uh, superimposed um, uh, on a ship would increase the power of the same uh, per length, right? So this would naturally make the ship bigger. And given that, aside from this iconographic evidence, we don't practically know about what at this early age the uh, the, the normal naval warfare was right, and how much this, the ships were employed, we can just go by guess. So, first of all, I will simply describe the um, the the ships that appear on the, 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 the well-known sculptures from Nineveh, from the, this the Assyrian source um, is from, in fact, and concentrate on. One of them specifically, that is this Phoenician Byreme, we will try to picture better structurally. Right, so um, there, there there are three types of ship that can be distinguished. Um, there are also somehow similar to the Decrotos of the, uh, of the Louvre galleys that we've seen for the uh, for the Greeks here. And um, when it's provided, this is provided with a pronounced ram and rowed up by up to 17 rowers aside. 
at two levels. This is different from the Atlantic counterpart because it has a deck over the rowers' heads, right? So for what, what we understand, the Atlantic, uh, again, ships at this point were not properly decked to lodge to, to su superimpose levels of, of rowers. This is Syrian one is, and that's why we start calling it like a bireme per se, right? Because you have the entire ship structure built ex exactly to accommodate these two levels of, of oars, right? Um, and uh, the, the, the deck over the rower's hands uh, is also where passengers are seated. The second type has also two levels of oars, right? However, it appears to be rather round, kind of wide, and conspicuously differs from the first because it has no ram, prow and stem being of similar form uh, instead. Then we have the third type, which is like the second uh, in the latter respect, uh, yet still smaller and uh, less rounded. Right, so the first two types uh, are represented as serving specifically as we were saying before, in the evacuation of Tyre itself uh, in 701 BC by King Luli under the threat of the Assyrian um, Sennacherib, which were properly some Phoenicians in action. So the, th the third type said is um, carrying off timber by the Assyrians. Right. So we see, of course, that these ships independently of how they were depicted by the uh, by the artist here that may have probably not even been particularly knowledgeable about these ships um, structure uh, seems to have been naturally homogeneous again we don't have to expect that here uh, the Assyrians were not a, a maritime people but they they used it essentially a mostly Phoenician culture. This would happen also later on with the uh, with the Achaemenids, with everyone who ruled from there. Um, and um, and say that compared to, to the Atlantic ones as well, right? The, the Mediterranean naval technology at this point was significantly advanced and probably shared by again peoples that were so also closely uh, interacting. The point, though, is aside from this iconographic evidence that is quite eloquent because it does show that independently from the, the bar, some other experiments that the Greeks may have been toying with, again, multiple ores level, that the Phoenicians had the m most advanced naval technology known at the time, considered that in parallel, as we've seen in, in, in the video about the Assyrian siege warfare, etc., the Assyrian Empire was the, the single most advanced in military technology as well. So uh, there was surely a proximity, like civilization at that point came from essentially Egypt and the Near East. So it makes sense, right, to see something, so say in the scantity of, of evidence, of course, that shows, like, I don't know, relatively more primitive peoples already having a certain technology even before somebody else, again, depicted. And in the meanwhile, yes, we don't have the equivalent um, for the more advanced peoples because it's difficult to find the sources in the first place. But when these appear slightly afterwards, they already show something uh, more substantially more advanced, right? The problem is that exactly because of this lack of information, and we rely, again, mostly on iconography here, right? We don't have um, documentary sources that give us any uh, precise information, at least, about this, especially the, the creation of, again, uh, ships with superimposed uh, rows of oars. While the average warship would have been a single row pentacons there, uh, we think that uh, some ships, and this may have been particularly the case of the Phoenicians, may have varied in fact in size uh, to the point of being powered by as many as 100 oars, as we will see now 
you could simply think to double on the base of you know of, of the rows um it, it's not that uh, kind of mathematically direct but it's possible things were going in in that direction right the only hint um i've been able to find uh, about this is from the 6th century so of course it's substantially far away but now technology d didn't suddenly kind of skyrocket uh, if not by the time standards I mean the essentials being there a battle fought between the Phoenicians and the Hellenes this is the one uh, of Alalia of Corsica around 540 BC again quite uh, uh, archaic times uh, this was a ramming combat by the way uh, between the Carthaginians and the Phocaeans mm -hmm. uh, and we know that both sides used uh, 50 or pentaconters purpose-built warships with rams however the Carthaginians on this occasion may have also uh, watered, not to say fielded, uh, larger biremes of some sort. The, the contest was a draw, right? Of course, the incidence of these larger ships, as always for the technology of the time, was like, I don't know, just saying for, for the sake of example, you had one bireme and then f f um, uh, for ten pentacont, right? Let's put it this way. Um, we don't, on that occasion, that the Phocaeans maintained a toehold in southern Gaul and the eastern part of Sicily while the Carthaginians retained overall superiority in the western Mediterranean. Um, this depended naturally not on, at least overwhelmingly not by which kind of ships they had, which in any case the Phocaeans may have had as well, right? Um, so can we picture essentially what a Phoenician bireme around 700 BC could have, could have looked like, really. Based on the aforementioned essentially second ship uh, from the Assyrian sculptures of Nineveh, preserved at the Louvre. Well, yes, uh, this is just a prototype, right? It doesn't have to be literally what it... Uh, it it's mostly based on that picture. Right, so ships could vary. There was not really a, a standardization in the sense we intend. There was a great variety, um, but the essence, like the core of these ships, would, would have been the same, conceptually and structurally. If, especially in this case, the bireme had already been again outlined so neatly, like in the picture, which again means that this technology may have been around this type of ship specifically for quite a while right even centuries so the interesting aspect here is that the ship had the same number of rowers as the pentaconter right but this greater power as we've seen uh, per length because of course these same rowers same number of rowers is disposed on two levels right so this changes a lot of, of things right first of all the structure is taller and this as you know Considering that we are we were at the dawn of ramming warfare, and still most of you know, the, of course, of the engagement was about uh, boarding and all you know, entailed that the taller you were, uh, and in this sense structurally, so with with an entire deck, as you will see now, with with soldiers on board could uh, throw the the hell on you, confer uh, oh, somebody on an enemy was was um uh, lower right uh, conferred a, a significant advantage of some sort um and since the upper rowers of course this this entails with all the kind of so the, the difference in length that can facilitate some maneuvers etc there are some complications because of course also, ramming is a very complex thing. I will make a video about how this was actually done because it required literally all the marines on deck to literally move in a very specific way to load the, you know, the the impact right on the enemy. 
and this this entails uh, a remarkable training in the first place. But say since the upper rowers are visible uh, in the in the iconography here, uh, it, it is inferred because the, the entire structure is not clear. Like the picture is somehow I uploaded it in in the in the background uh, somewhere. It, it's just not like a full kind of dimension of how that this structure really was, right? No matter because there is an approximation, whatever. So we mostly base ourselves on what we can reconstruct sensibly, and this is still an interpretation of some sort. It is at least inferred that these upper rowers set outboard of the lower oarsmen. So something we have seen um, that let's say the, actually in the opposite way to the Hellenic model before, right? That was deckless, but had somehow the uh, the upper rowers likely actually in um, inboard inboard compared to the lower one, right? Here it's it's different. Because while in the first case what you what you think there is just perhaps the simplest form um, that can uh, confer you greater stability um, as a vessel at sea and kind of this greater amount of rowers and or at least uh, yeah because that seems that just the need is an absolute increase in them what you have here is perhaps something more functional to again boarding because you have essentially a, a superstructure that is protruded towards external and if that's decked especially you can simply use that as a platform to jump better on the enemy ship and in part it does create problems it may create problems um, to any other ship that uh, wants to ram you if there are structures um, like I don't know a tower at the prow for example that is going to impact it has to to crash fundamentally against this uh, superstructure and partly absorb the the hit of the same ramming, which just does an idea, but it, it could be it. Um, the and uh, and the or arrangement again may have simply been like an alternated one, like um, literally you have you have the, this rows that are posed with a single guy in a alternated uh, in across the, the length of the of the ship to one that is uh, uh, eventually up and then have in the front of this guy one is down so that the the rows are all um, interspersed uh, among one another uh, in, relatively to the this, this two superimposed rows uh, are uh, and a single mast and sail are carried. This was again normal. All kind of the naval maneuvers occurred in combat, just through oaring. But naturally, these were sailing ships as well for for reaching the the area of the fight and so on. And they they would tend to 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 take off the the mast and sail to, during combat because first of all they could take fire. It could it could be damaged in the first place, so even for further maneuvering could have been complicated later, um, and it just uh, uh, brought less risks. And these are stowed along the center line, in fact, when uh, not used. Uh, there is a large ram as well, but the extensive screening of the upper works indicates reliance on boarding. As we were, uh, hy you know, theorizing before, and the carrying, and the the carrying of large numbers of archers, likely, right? Because most of the the maneuver, right, was, uh, you know, the, of a ramming, boarding, etc., were um, carried out through, uh, you know, under a significant cover, and or suppressing fire, depending on which side taking consideration it was completely normal and uh, there was a lot of incendiary devices and so on um, ram tactics as we were saying before were not particularly 
developed at this time, right? They were in the, in their relative infancy. There was really just for the structure of the ships, um, kind of of a relative uh, capacity, even just to um, to impact the enemy that that and to pin him down in the first place, right? In, in the, the the more naval warfare uh, advanced and the more this this ships uh, remain interlocked with one another, right? At this point, instead things were relatively simpler, thus. Ramming was less of a of a chance. Habitually, it was still there though, because, of course, the rams are there. So th that means it, it uh, they they were used, they worked, um, and there was surely also a great technique there. But it's not like what we've seen also just in later times. Say by the time of the Persian Wars, etc., where incidentally the same Greeks and Phoenicians fought uh, at sea. The um, Formation of the upper works here suggests how this vessel also uh, was set up for essentially developing into the trireme already, right? Not just because um, the, of course, once you have multiple rows, you can literally create lots of them, and this this was happen in, in this would happen in Hellenistic times and beyond. But the frames are carried well above the level of the gun whales. That is, the, the upper edge of planking of the side of, of the ship. As well as the oars. And just like in, in the pentaconter. About uh, 60 centimeters, a couple of feet above the gun whale, was a wicker screen painted uh, apparently in particular squares um, and fixed um, it, it, you can see that above the frames are open but carry round shields so there is definitely a need of uh, extra protection at that height which is basically the one of the torso so this is kind of interesting because it tells you kind of even the chances of that you know projectiles could uh, could pass through the the wicker protection, and uh, you know some some projectiles were were shot with really great great power. Already, you wanted to be uh, you know uh, well protected, right? These were the men on the deck, so the marines and the sailors, etc. So uh, it was vital to to protect them. Uh, in many ways, the the rowers are somehow well protected uh, as well overall um, there were ways to offend them as well we've seen it in some videos especially the one about Byzantine warfare I don't think that naval warfare changed that much in certain aspects and some even of the most rudimentary ones when you would go to 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 kill people there are evident gangways along each side of the ship behind the screens, right? And decks at bow and stern on the level of the gangways, right? So these raised platforms, walkways, providing a passage around it. This naturally reveals also, the again, the, the complexity the, the, of, of combat, the necessity for moving uh, around the ship with an important uh, speed to, to counter some maneuvers that could damage uh, the, the the crew or in order the same structure uh, of the ship. Um, this ship, as we are outlining it, um, could be lengthened, as we were saying before, to accommodate more rowers. Right. As we see this, we, there could be others that would simply make the magic in a way. There would be huge ships for those time standards, right? And it's possible that again, there were even particularly elaborated one and already something kind of more more complex than we think before the trireme became more or less the, the standard vessel um, in the following centuries. And if we were to think of the double number 
of rowers. Um, well, here they, they could be carried um, without the ship being longer than the pentaconter if you simply double the the rows, uh, superimposing them in the way we illustrate. Uh, a larger ship could carry more marines. In general, it would be preferred to the 50 rower vessel as it's 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 shown, right? So uh, that's why we were saying before, simply making the maths, you could simply double the pentaconter to level of rowers having 100 of them, and this means that it has it's a ship with the same length, uh, but essentially the you know so a deck that can host more troops, also probably internally more troops um, could be could be kept under and or uh, you know hidden and maybe for an ambush or, or, or something so uh, naturally the larger the ship the more the more marine power it may have so if we count again what we illustrated here as the say half and pentaconter but with the same amount as in length at least with the same amount of rowers um, you uh, you have essentially the same rowing power but less deck space. Again, you could store more troops in the in this taller structure inside the ship, but um, there was also just uh, you know it could be a, a disadvantage as well because if you met with troops uh, with a pentaconter, let's say you you may had had the, the advantage of of the height. Yet, um, still, we don't have to think these structures were particularly huge, uh, and the enemy could have still tried to, to suppress you with the majority, the advantage you had numerically of just the troops were already on the deck, uh, which was a risk that you know you may have not have wanted to take in, in some circumstances. Um, there is a, um, a structural problem here because if you increased the length right by maintaining the number of um, of uh, the double rows so extended you would need an increase in beam to keep the ratio about 8 to 1 as it was the case however this would have entailed that the curvature of the ship's side would tend to pinch in the rowers at the ends of the vessel as well. So at least a part of them, the, uh, of space there would have been lost. Um, there were two ways to get past this problem. One would be to increase further the, the ore power of the ship. Right. Uh, and so making it longer in the first place and so th this would could cause some problems even in the maneuverability just in the general kind of advantage you could gain in uh, in, in maneuvering and all this thing uh, the other one was turning the gangways above the two levels of existing rowers into a rectangular platform frame and putting rowers instead of marines in it Right, and so you could kind of accommodate uh, fifty percent more oarsmen in such a fashion. That's why probably you see this outward uh, structure here. It may have made the bar center of the vessel less stable, but given that the rowers were to be hopefully accommodated in a in a symmetric way, this should have not been a, a huge issue. Uh, it could have just have brought to a greater inclination of the ship from the side. The troops would have concentrated to board the enemy one, uh, which could have even provided with, however, an advantage. Let's say it could have, uh, yeah, at, at the moment of a of a taller ship, as the troops who were inside could have just turned slightly uh, towards the enemy, so that they could pour more stuff on them while they were boarding them. However, that would be just for the moment of the boarding, because uh, uh, you know the, the more man you pour on the enemy deck, 
and the more that inclination is going to be reduced, right? Um, and in the case of like the addition of this further uh, gangways, like so from the gangways that we described here. Uh, may have been the way also this second row of sh of uh, of orders could have been uh, initially put right uh, by experimenting and you understand that if you did the same with this model uh, so turning the gangways in yet another row of rowers what do you get a trire <laughs> because now you have literally three rows um, and it's really likely that's how the trireme was born practically right trying to increase again stabilizing further the ship first of all the increasing of course its oaring power but also creating a structure that was ever more bulky and solid and so also ramming maneuvers becoming more viable but of course together with an enormous effort that had to, first of all in order to have uh, say required first of all more ships like the larger the ship uh, and again, either the more smaller ships have to contain it, or the more those ships have all to increase in size, which is exactly what happened. So the political and social cost of that has to be taken in consideration. The Greeks would eventually develop that to beat basically the Phoenicians and the, and the Persians um, uh, later, right? Uh, this was yet to happen, but it's exactly how we would get down like um, the so these are not things I mean that can be done overnight you can't just project okay I, I just will build this huge ship with multiple rows but then what right how agile is going that to be how you know it can be huge but it can also be surrounded more easily it can be blocked more easily and and at sea things are even in that sense more limiting um, than, than on land um, given that you don't rely just on some immediately flexible option but just on a, on a bulky ship on, on water right so this could not happen that, that's why at the beginning I was illustrating that case of the Atlantic uh, of the Atlantic by right as it was just forming as with two rows of of um, of horsemen because it's likely that these experiments had already been carried out for quite a long time, but that they they were too that they had technolo technology, and by the time, of course, we see it developed fully with the trireme, we know that they had been at least experimenting it from quite a while. They had maximized it, they had refined it, and also in times in which we are told like not that the triremes were a brand new thing, so. It's perfectly likely that at this point there were already more biremes than we think around that there had already been. It's just that either that they were rarer and or properly they were not suited for the particular tactics that um, for for the type of warfare again it was limited compared to what would happen later and so required kind of smaller ships uh, still in in the numbers that required not just a much greater ship. Without, uh, you know, and just uh, without at least a substantial amount of smaller ones that could support it. Uh, this is really, uh, really important historically because you would have a bit of back and forth of this thing. Um, also, as far as land armies were concerned, it was pretty much the same, right? There were limited resources, and just like in late antiquity, you see that the, the massive ships of, say, Hellenistic and Roman times uh, that were made for big powers to clash against one another very rarely, every once in a while, were supplanted by just on land with smaller armies, with smaller ships, smaller galleys. Um, and at that point you don't need those big ships anymore. It doesn't mean that they didn't have the technology for doing that. And the fact that naval warfare was just arriving to the triring doesn't mean that, again, it was just a huge effort. It just was just how warfare was at the time. It hadn't required the construction of these more complex systems. If we were to give dimensions to this Byrene prototype of the 700 BC we, we looked at here, we could think of a length of 21 meters. 
a beam of 3.3 and a drought of 90 centimeters and we can give it a crew of 50 rowers 50 oars um, 20, 25 marines and perhaps 10 sailors etc like the as understand are small vessels right this is the buyer that would be the uh, practically this, all this, the smallest uh, warships used in the, in the, in, the, in the following sea entries um, yet they were beginning to be a big deal at the time they began to really provide with even structurally as we've seen especially here the introduction of the deck means like an acquired mm, capacity like in providing with substantial stability um, a substantial amount of troops that had to know even how now to 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 move on on the ship to to favor ramming specifically and everything gets more structured with two um, levels of warsmen and uh, a even the capacity of uh, adapting a third one right and so in in a couple of centuries you would have their already a very different picture right even though the technology more or less remained uh, the same right and this of course is to be explained politically and socially of course the mil militarily as far as these factors um, influenced the the same the, the same mechanism right um, for today however stop it here we'll talk again about Phoenician warfare ancient warships again this is part of a of a series that began a uh, couple of years ago almost that I you know it's part of the bigger cycle with all these other sub cycles uh, and uh, I you know I, I post that just every once in a while however it's particularly interesting because naval warfare is somehow overlooked in these aspects and can help you know building there is a playlist you can check that out uh, so you can see all what I've done if you're going to find the uploads the new uploads there uh, and we'll hopefully go on with that uh, for today however I stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.